In May 1974, Duke Ellington said goodbye to us all. In remembrance tonight, we're going back to 1967 for a journey on the road with Duke Ellington. until you hear from me. Sophisticated lady. The composer of these classics is Duke Ellington. At the peak of a career that has spanned 40 years and won nearly every triumph the world of music can offer him, Duke is about to receive an honorary doctor's degree from Yale University. Edward Kennedy Ellington. It is a special pleasure for Yale to confer on you the degree Doctor of Business. Yale is honoring Duke Ellington for a life he has lived in an extraordinary way, traveling endlessly in a wild but creative state of public performing and private composing, his state of being on the road. On Duke's road, Yale has been another brief stop in an odyssey for which location hardly matters, and the rush is toward musical destinations he keeps finding in his mind. To Duke, Yale's degree and enthusiastic reception hold a special meaning. It's another bit of encouragement uh, in being made aware of the fact that somebody's listening. And uh, that's the thing I'm in. That's the thing I do. I make noises, and there's no point in making noises if somebody's not listening. Enthusiasm and the fact that they do listen means that uh, we're not alone, you know. And uh, we don't want to be alone. You're wonderful, and I you. finally get to shake your hand, huh? Yeah, I'm getting lucky. God bless you. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> Standing over at the ticket counter, I turned around and looked at you and I thought, gee, he looks like he should be important. It looks like Duke Ellington with long hair. <laughs> being on the road assures Duke Ellington of never really being alone. But it also provides a kind of isolation he needs to compose. The new music, he turns out, creates another need for him that helps keep his band on the road. A lot of the music, I think, has got to hear his music. That keeps me sort of trapped with a band because I'm rather the impetuous type of person who, if I write it tonight, I want to hear it tomorrow night, you know. So I can't afford to wait for somebody else to decide to call the rehearsals or I keep my own band. You know? <laughs> Duke has kept his band playing continuously for 40 years and into an era when the music business has failed to support other big bands. He's done it by staying on the move, seeking out his audiences around the world. In the last year, we've been to Europe for eight weeks. We have been uh, into Africa, Senegal. We've been to Japan. We've been from coast to coast, I don't know how many times, in the United States and in Canada. And Every night I give a house party and I'm the guest of honor. The party that assembles nearly every night in Duke's life expects to hear him play Mood Indigo, Sophisticated Lady, Satin Doll, and the other old favorites he wrote long ago. Happy birthday! Now, Duke Ellington is 68 years old, and more magnificent by 20, 30, and 40 years, his friends believe, than the composer of the old songs. Students in college courses devoted to Ellington and fans in Ellington clubs throughout the world know that he has continued to expand his range and depth in symphonic suites, tone parallels of Negro history, exalted sacred music, and intricate jazz orchestrations. 
the big crowds continue to demand the old nostalgic songs that have become a part of their lives. But many serious Ellington fans are saddened to see the great Duke, after playing the same old standards for so many years, going out to play them again and again. songwriter and right now I'd like to play a few of those songs we've written. Some have become hits, some have become standards and of course we hope that all of our compositions are among your favorites. <laughs> Satin Doll, Duke wrote 14 years ago. ago. Among the Ellington admirers this night is another great jazz musician, Louis Armstrong. Why don't you come up and blow on Louis Armstrong? Listen, listen, listen. Out of the stage, yeah? there are very few people out there who buy a ticket to you. That's the respect. I, I like just love to buy that ticket for Cadillac and the very few dressing rooms. You, know? you folk in there for him, one piece. He you. knows that. If he played a Apollo anywhere, I always come back stage to take it. And a whole lot of you cats in the order. I'm not doing no particular reason, but there's the warmth. Who would take that word? <laughs> I got the accent, but no vocabulary. I'm no job. I'm not even going to cut that out. Thanks for coming by. I just had to come in. But you want to do something about Tyree. Tell me every moment. Beautiful. And you sell that band. And... But then you're playing all that. 
Well, I'm stage fright, you know, I guess they... Oh, you're doing a lot, Cindy. And they build around you, it's beautiful. I like that. I get stage bread. You know. I don't know what to do. Stage bread. You know what to do. Well, stay, stay that way. Stay that way. You blow it. Now Duke can begin his personal work of the evening. At the end of his day as a performer, Duke is left alone by the crowds and the band and gets down to composing, working out at the piano the musical thoughts that have been generating in his mind all day. Duke is composing this song to present at Morgan State College where he'll be awarded another honorary degree. late and it's the job of Duke's road manager to get him back on the road. wake up in a hotel or the home of old friends, but always with the same request. Where's the hot water, sweetie? Huh? Where's the hot water? What do you want in this hot water, dude? Nothing, sweetie. Just hot water? Just hot water. No lemon, no nothing? No, nothing. Hot water. This is three, five, five. Four, three, five. And we forgot the hot water operator. Duke drinks no coffee or tea, just hot water. Yes. He brought everything with the hot water. Would you please send it? Uh, because I'm in the middle of my meal, and that should have been the first thing. Oh, Duke begins breakfast with a baked potato, steak, and unless he forgets, by saying grace. Hey, give me some hot water, will you, baby, please? Yeah. This, please. For one hour. My first meal is my foundation meal. Like when I first get out of bed, I start today. I have my foundation meal, which is the big meal, because I never know when I'm gonna, gonna eat again or what it's gonna be. So I don't gamble on this one. Mmm. Finally, the day has begun. Duke's day usually begins with his son, Mercer Ellington, who plays trumpet in the band and manages Duke's complicated schedule of engagements, interviews, and personal calls. I'm very glad. To Ella Fitzgerald, do you know her? Do you know her address? On Sierra Drive? Yeah, all right. Put happy birthday, love, and kisses. Uh, 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 Duke Ellington and uh, Billy Strayhorn. Huh? Billy Strayhorn. S T R A Y H O R N. Oh, just put the Ellingtons and the Strayhorns. Well, no, I, retirement is a kind of a funny word because uh, nobody can, can seem to tell me what I'm going to retire to. You know, if you tell me what I'm going to retire to, then I've got a choice. But, uh, you know, stagnation ain't going to look good on me, I'm sure. 
<laughs> Today, Duke doesn't have to travel, and he'll devote every spare moment to composing his new piece. Duke has been composing music for 54 years, but his inspiration still responds in capricious ways. Well, you sort of just live, uh, as I say, in search of that melody. You know, that's what it actually boils down to, racing around. And after you've absorbed the day and you get all settled down, you're quiet, you're all ready to go to sleep now, you turn out the light, you put your head on the pillow, and you get your sleeping stance together, and there's the idea you've been looking for all day long, you know? And you get up and put the light on, and get the paper and the pencil, and jot it down, put the light out. And usually before you go to sleep, you got the next part of it. <laughs> Duke has found that the place can be as important as the time. As far as I'm concerned, I think the best way, place to work is in one room, not a suite. In the middle of the city, if possible, we'll vacuum clean the working outside the door. We'll go downstairs to the dining room with the bar where the piano is, and they clean it up in the middle of the night. That's good. That's real good and productive. It's wonderful isolation because the cleaners don't bother you. And, and then you, you get good isolation. It's mental isolation anyway, it's not physical isolation. Tomorrow, Duke will perform his new composition accompanied by bass and drums. If he had time, he'd write out the music for the other musicians to read. But Dawn is catching up. Because there is no written music for today's performance, Duke will try to describe the piece in such a way that the other musicians will be able to play it. And then do A, B, D, B, C. Dot, 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 G, A, B flat, B natural, C, C, and G flat, F. And probably, and then, oh, I'm going to play dot, D, dot, D, dot, the long. Morgan State College is giving Duke an honorary doctorate, and he'll play the piece he's been composing for the occasion, which he has named Salute to Morgan State. Duke will play the new composition once. It will probably never be written down or recorded.
Now that he's heard Salute to Morgan State perform, Duke will probably be satisfied to leave it behind, as he has hundreds of other Ellington compositions, of which no record or written music remains. A guy who writes music, I think, has got to hear his music. Otherwise, I mean, I mean, there used to be days years ago when people would come out of the conservatory after investing the greatest part of their life, you know, maybe 10 years and many times more. They've mastered all the devices of the masters and they uh, written symphonies, concertos, rhapsodies, and never got to hear them. Duke's greatest opportunity to hear his most recent orchestral compositions is the recording session. Coming on the second beat. Oh, I like that. Come in. Seven, eight, one. Seven, eight, one. Seven, eight, one. Is that difficult over here? No. Hmm? Well, we're not getting it in the beginning. One more time, right? Bum, bum, ba da da one, two, three, and bum. Mm -hmm. Watch it. Rolling! Hey! Bum, bum, ba da 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 Duke sets the percussive pace from the piano. This is Rondelet being recorded for RCA. music it's it's still in it's feeding I'm eating you know, I'm taking it uh, not uh, intravenously or whatever it is you're taking it mentally you're absorbing you're regenerating as long music is very regenerating when performed 
if you write it, that's giving. That's the investment. When you hear it back, you get back the gross, and you uh, system automatically um, takes out the investment and it determines the profit in joy. Occasionally, Duke also has an opportunity to hear his more recent compositions at concerts for special audiences, religious or symphonic. Duke has just conducted the Kalamazoo Symphony in his well-known Harlem Suite, and now he's returning to unleash one of his most dazzlingly orchestrated modern compositions, Traffic Jam. <laughs> Tonight, when Duke's road manager tries to get him back on the road, Duke breaks into the first song he ever wrote at age 13 and a half, Soda Fountain Rag. It's too hard. I can't, I can't finger it anymore. It's sort of fountain red. Because when I was 14 in there, I, mean, I only knew about two numbers. You know. And of course, piano playing in those days was a, a great part of your piano playing went with the way you sat down. And of course, this is a skill that was acquired by standing all night long over top of the good piano players, watching their approach to the piano. And see a guy would come in, you know, and he'd wear a fancy cap, you know, and he'd take his, and you know, there used to be some real fancy kids around, you know. He'd come into the, into the, oh, so-and-so, Swifty played or something. He says, well, yeah, he'd sit down at the piano, take his uh, handkerchief out, and dust off the keys, 
back to that. And then the first, the first note, that's the one. And you hit a strange chord that nobody had ever heard before. So, yang, you know, and everybody, hey, you know, <laughs> like that, you know. And then you have, then you would noodle a little bit, you know, and sort of wiggle into tempo, <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, that, that was a great thing. Edward Kennedy Ellington was eight years old when he was nicknamed Duke by his schoolmates in recognition of his already impeccable dress and a certain well-bred air. Well, you see, it was considered a privilege to pet me because my mother didn't let my feet touch the ground until I was eight years old. And anybody who wanted to pet me, she had to watch. <laughs> She'd laugh, she'd leave me in the custody of her mother. <laughs> and all these uh, girls and the, the, the mother's and sisters. Duke's grandmother was a figure of correctness and good manners. His aunts surrounded him with dignified femininity and a sense of style. His father worked for the Navy Department in Washington, D.C., and set an example that encouraged Duke to show his love for his mother and strive to please her. Duke carried this over to womankind in general with a gallant appreciation of the opposite sex that flowered from the first day he ever played in public, a day that led Duke at once into the nightlife of a musician. And up until that day, I was a great athlete, you know, like football, baseball, track, everything, you know. And the next morning, out in front of my house was three of the prettiest little girls you've ever seen in your life, looking up at the window saying, Mrs. Ellington, is Edward ready? And she says, yes, darling, he's coming right down. And I ain't been no athlete since. <laughs> that was the end of my athletic career. As well as the chick sitting over there, and you're playing the piano. He says, Amy. My son, you know my son, Mercer. No. This is uh, Miss Pam Newby. You remember Columbus, Mercer? Beautiful place. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. Look at this. Uh, the greatest happenings are here. Mm-hmm. Aren't they? Yeah. I knew it the minute I looked at you. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yes. Duke's band scored its first sensational success in 1927 with its historic opening at the Cotton Club in New York, and Duke was hailed as the master of a new jazz idiom. At first, Duke directed from the piano and was hardly considered a master of ceremonies by himself or his agent. And uh, Saturday night, he came backstage and he says, uh, they like it. Monday, you open the palace. I knew people have been... In, on the stage for 20 years and never played the palace. And he says, I'm going to, you're going to play the palace Monday morning. I said, the palace? Yeah. He says, all right, don't worry about it. Play the same show. He says, he's got his cigar and he walks on out of the door. Oh, he says, oh, yeah, only one thing. What's that? Announce your numbers. Good night. And I had never opened my mouth before. First time I opened my mouth, was at the palace. On the stage. And then I got up from the piano after that first number and started crawling down towards the footlights. You know, like, inch. All the applause is going on, you know. And finally, I got nerve enough to stop about eight feet from the footlights. And I started to, in a very, very timid manner, I thanked them very politely, however. And uh, got through the show, and the man came back, said, he says, great! He says, that's a new style of emceeing. And so Ellington, the composer, piano player, and conductor, also became Ellington, the front man. With a debonair grace and ducal ease, he's made famous everywhere in the venerable Ellington lesson on finger snapping. 
rhythmic device we use to put under this finger snapping bit, ladies and gentlemen. And you are all con invited to join the finger snapping crazy. I see I don't have to tell you. Nobody snaps their fingers on the beat. It's considered aggressive. Don't push it, just let it fall. And if you would like to be conservatively hip, and at the same time, tilt the left yellow. Establish a state of nonchalance. And if you would like to be respectably cool, and tilt the left yellow on the beat and snap the finger on the after beat there. Then you really don't care. And so by routining one's finger snapping and choreographing one's halo tilting, one discovers that one can become as cool as one wishes to be. With that, we certainly want to thank you for the wonderful way you've inspired us and remind you that you are very beautiful, very sweet, very gracious, very generous, and we do love you madly. Thank you. Ellington had been featured in more than a half dozen films when this one appeared in 1942, picturing his band in a fancy streamlined train. He's playing Take the A Train, which actually refers to a subway that rattles underground in Harlem. Though it's Duke's theme song, Ellington did not write it. The composer of Take the A Train is Billy Strayhorn, the only man able to decipher and reproduce the intricacies of Duke's musical style and the only man Ellington has ever accepted as a full partner in composing music. Duke's friendship with Billy Strayhorn has become a major feature of his life since that day in 1938 when they first met. Billy Strayhorn was 23 years old when he asked Duke to listen to amateur compositions he'd written for a high school performance. Duke liked Billy's compositions and offered him a job before he quite knew how he'd use him. He gave Billy some numbers to arrange, which Billy did in surprising style. Duke took the trouble to show Billy how he wrote and arranged. Billy Strayhorn learned fast, with an understanding that delighted Duke, and began to make them a team. Billy also began to compose his own songs in the Ellington idiom, and Duke made them famous. When Duke ran into a tough problem, Billy was there to think with him and feed back answers. And finally, it became that wherever Duke was, Billy was. Never in the foreground, but always there, living the Ellington life and giving back a spirited and highly talented response. But lately, Billy hasn't been feeling so well. Hmm? He's back home. I just talked to him. He said he feels pretty good. He was out visiting Lena for last week. Out in Palm Springs. And I guess he'll go back in the hospital again for checkup with him. Billy Strayhorn was more seriously ill than anyone knew. In May 1967, Billy died. To me, Billy Strayhorn was the severest critic, editor. He was, he had the greatest authority. I mean, uh, with Billy Strayhorn, I always had a great security, you know. The audiences marvel at the grandeur of his tonal supremacy the mantle of which he wore only with grace. A beautiful human being adored by a wide range of friends. Of friends. Rich, poor, famous, and unknown. Great artists pay homage to Billy Strayhorn's mastery of his graft. Because of his God-given creative ability, 
he calls on applying himself to his rare sensitivity, Billy Strayhorn accomplished a marriage of melody, words and harmony like fitting made compatible with happiness. Billy Strayhorn, Duke Ellington, May 31st, 1967. In late spring 1967, Duke Ellington turned to composing a new religious concert he expects to complete in 1968. Now, I play a lot of places. Now, I play nightclubs, and gambling casinos, and uh, the, the greatest music halls in the world, the greatest concert halls with the greatest symphonies in the world, and all that for a living. But when I play sacred music, I play this for me. This is personal. This is not career. This is the most important thing in my life. <laughs> He's dancing before the Lord with all his might. Inspired by the story of a juggler who performed before the altar, Duke wrote this song to the biblical quotation about King David for the sacred concert that serves as Duke Ellington's own passionate religious offering. If a man were given uh, the power and the privilege of seeing God, he still wouldn't have the power to show him to somebody else, to show God to somebody else. Or to show God to somebody, and it, it, it's impossible. Beyond that, I mean, it's, it's even that, just that much more impossible to show God to, some, to an unbeliever. If you don't believe, you can't see God. You close your eyes, you can see God. But, but not by looking. You see, you see, you look and you look and you see, and it's there. God is there. And now we come to the major theme of our sacred concert, which is taken from the first four words in the Bible. In the beginning, God. We say these six syllables many, many times, rhythmically, melodically, instrumentally, and vocally. The vocal will be handled by Tony Watkins. We start now with John Lamb, Harry Connie, Jimmy Hamilton.
no earth, no nothing. In the beginning, in the beginning, in the beginning, God. Duke Ellington is a modern composer of such range and depth, subtlety and complexity, that many of those who know him best are saddened to hear him playing the same old tunes endlessly demanded by the big audiences. Oh, these are the people with the ears. And my major interest is people who have ears. Without the people who have ears, we don't know to anything. We're not working for anything. We're working, we could be very well sit home and write music and then play it on the piano and listen to it. Or if we found musicians who were sufficiently enthusiastic to work without money, we could have a nice uh, uh, workshop rehearsal orchestra or something like that for laughs, you know. But that isn't very kicky. You, know? you play for yourself and you play for the people, you play for everybody. You don't want to be any nicer to yourself than you are to the people. And so, the performer plays the old favorites with a feeling of purpose, nostalgia, and love that keeps the composer creating, that keeps Duke Ellington happily on the road alive with all his creations, present, future, and past.
Into another night, Duke Ellington moves on. Looking for that piano with vacuum cleaner accompaniment, where he can continue working on the new Ellington compositions. Music so advanced, sophisticated and modern, that this year the jazz critics of Europe and America voted Ellington the world's best composer, top arranger, with the finest band, who turned out the finest recordings, new and old. That's Duke Ellington, on the road, at age 68. That's how the film ended in 1967. There was music by Duke we didn't have time to include in that film then. We'd like to end with some of it now. We'd like to do now our theme, Billy Strayhorn's Take the A Train. <laughs> 